great, perfect, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I am Stephanie Young, the Executive Director of the 251 Club of Vermont, and I want to officially call our annual meeting to order. Thank you for being here with us today. It's great to see so many familiar faces who I've met over the years, and then to meet members um, who are attending the first annual meeting, including at our table right here. Um, I think this is our, your first annual meeting. <laughs> So welcome. We'd also like to thank those members um, who are live streaming um, the event today via ORCA, and thank you to ORCA as well for being here. Um, and we're glad that so many members can join us either in person today or live stream um, or watch the recording um, in a few weeks. So we're gathered here today to celebrate being a club for 70 years. Yeah, 70 years, definitely an applause moment. <laughs> Since 1954, members of the club have all shared a common goal of exploring all of Vermont's cities and towns and finding out what makes Vermont so special. How members go about it, how they document their visits, and how long it takes may differ from one member to the next. But we all share the desire to seek out every corner of the state, discover Vermont's general stores, restaurants, shops, libraries, museums, parks, and create those lifelong memories. This year, to celebrate 70 years, we were honored to have Governor Phil Scott proclaim July 7th through the 13th as the 251 Club of Vermont Week. <laughs> yes. Governor Scott, who himself is a member of the club, highlighted what makes the club so special in the proclamation and the community that exists amongst the members. At this meeting each year, we also report on the club's accomplishments and important developments. In 2024, the club continued to have a strong membership base with new, new members joining us and members continuing to renew. And thanks to all of your support through memberships and through 251 Club merchandise purchases and your attendance here at today's event, which is our only fundraising event of the year, the club is also in a strong financial position to continue to grow and provide value to our members. We also continued our tradition of hosting a spring get together. Uh, and this year we held it at the Shelburne, Shelburne Museum. And I know many of you um, were there uh, this spring as well. We had about 100 members join us in Shelburne and we had a chance to explore the museum grounds and then also to connect over lunch. This year, we also continue to support the Woodridge Rehabilitation and Nursing Home. Uh, they've created their own 251 club. Um, and when they are able to, they go out and they um, visit different places throughout Vermont. And then if there are health concerns, um, they bring those places into uh, the residence um, there. And then we also added in support to a middle school classroom this year at the Mill River Unified Union School, school District. And at that school, we, a middle school teacher reached out to us, um, and she started a 251 Club class for the middle school students there. So we donated memberships to that class, um, and she told me that the semester is off to a great start. And that class at the middle school is researching all the historical roadside markers in Vermont. By the end of two semesters, we will have donated 40 memberships to that class um, and to those students to learn about Vermont and the club. And then finally, after five wonderful years with the club, I am stepping down as the executive director at the end of this year. These past years, I've had the honor of getting to know so many of you, and I, I see so many faces that I have known now for five years. Um, and I've enjoyed hearing all of your stories and your memories, and I know I'm taking from all of you different places that I want to go explore in Vermont with my family. My family and I were at 203 cities and towns, so we're making our way, um, and we're hoping to finish up our quest, and I will continue to be an active member of the club. I will no longer be the director, but I will be sitting here with all of you next year as well. Um, the club has been very special to me and has meant a lot to me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So with all that being said, um, I'd like to thank all of you again for your support. And I also wanted our board of directors to please stand and to give them a round of applause as well. They do a lot of work on behalf of the club, um, not just with the annual meeting, but throughout the whole year. So board of directors, if you can please stand up. And thank all of you for... 
Thank you. Okay, so now with that, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Steve Perkins, um, the executive director of the Vermont Historical Society. So Steve has been the director of the Historical Society since 2015. And if you haven't had a chance to meet Steve yet um, while on an event or visiting the Historical Society Museum in Montpelier, which is, I think, basically down the street, right, across the road, um, where my family and I have gone often, or to the History Center and Library in Barrie, then you might have seen them on This Place in History. And it's a program that runs on ABC 22 and Fox 44. Steve's passion for Vermont and for our history is clear from not only the stories he tells during that program, but also the stories we learn about through the Vermont Historical Society Museum. Everyone who visits the museum comes away with a profound sense of Vermont's history across many eras, including everything from the origin of our winter sports that we value here in Vermont to the development and protection of our lands. And after Steve speaks, um, I believe that we will have time for a Q&A. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Steve, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much. Oh, I'm going to try to get this video going. I was asked to speak about This Place in History, a program where I get to travel all over the state of Vermont. And I think it's warming up visit sites, visit towns, um, but necessarily need some video. So I'm going to share some video with you today um, of our program. May have to press a button. Well, while that is uh, warming up, um, I'll tell you a bit about the origins of this program, this place in history. I hope everybody's maybe seen at least one episode of this program. It does run every single Thursday during every single newscast on both Channel 22 and Channel 24. Um, when I was uh, first hired at the Vermont Historical Society, um, I had been working with some folks at the news station um, and we got talking about how can we make history come alive for a general public, not just the scholars. I mean, I know all of you are probably members of the Historical Society and you read the journal cover to cover, but there are a lot of Vermonters who don't. And getting your history in kind of fun, bite-sized pieces that will inspire you to explore the state was a real priority of mine. Oh, good. It looks like I have some. And we'll see if we can get the... All my settings reset, so we're going to make this work pretty quickly. There, that's what you're waiting for, my title slide. <laughs> Anyway, this place in history, discovering Vermont through places and stories. So like I said, I started working um, with the news station. I was hired in December of 2015, or I started in December of 2015 at the Vermont Historical Society. We started talking about this in February of 2016, um, and we managed to record our first programs at the end of May in, uh, in 2016. Um, the idea originally kind of had a six-month expiration. We're like, no, yeah, maybe this will this will last for about six months. We signed a six-month contract um, with the station. Um, if 22 and 44 share a newsroom, so if anyone watches those stations, you'll notice all the personnel are, are the same. So it's locally, it's the same station. They just broadcast ABC and, and Fox on two different um, channels. So we did a This Place in History, which was going to air every week. And we were going to do a This Day in History, which would broadcast daily on the morning show. And we worked with the uh, author and publisher of the Vermont Book of Days, um, where that work had already been done, great little publication, um, to use their imagery and research on kind of this day-by-day -day history of Vermont. Again, we thought it would only be like six months, so we would have plenty of material in case maybe we extended it um, to a year. Little did we know that, uh, you know, we're eight, 
approaching nine years in on this project. So, like I said, we recorded our first segment at the end of May um, in 2016, um, and the first four episodes to air um, were, and they weren't in the order we recorded them, um, Battery Park, Burlington Athletic Field, the Shalott Whale, and the Ethan Allen Tower. So I'm going to show you the very first episode we filmed. It was actually the second one that aired. Um, on the Burlington Athletic Field. So I don't like to watch these. I like to see weight change and hair change and you know all, all those things that happen uh, over uh, eight years. But this is Burlington Athletic Field. And what I'm going to do to make this audio work is I'm going to hold the microphone up to my computer speaker. So hopefully this. At this place in history, we're at the old UVM Athletic Park. This is Steve Perkins from the Vermont Historical Society. Hi, Steve. Good morning. So what happened here? Well, this was the original baseball field for the city of Burlington. And, you know, as you can see now, it's a trucking depot on busy Riverside Avenue. But back in the day, this is where everybody came to see baseball, sometimes football, any athletics, UVM, city of Burlington. What was it like back then? Well, you know, that trolley line went through where Riverside Avenue is right now. The railroad line went on the other side of the park. So people would generally use public transportation or walked, and they could show up and see a baseball game uh, really any time during the summer. The Vermont Historical Society has some artifacts from back then. What'd you bring? Well, we do. You know, we have a lot of stuff in our collection. I did bring some cool baseball cards that we've created to, that talks about some of the players that okay. played at this park. And these were players who played in Vermont and then in the major leagues. We've got Burt Abbey played for UVM. And then we've got Arlington Pond. People may recognize these names, maybe not. Gene Dubuque, Ray Collins. So baseball Hall of Fame yeah. player and Larry Gardner played for the Red Sox, played on three World Series teams, also grew up right here in Vermont, played on this field. Um, and then Doc Hazelton, Doc Hazelton played on this field and then coached on this field and later worked for UVM. Burlington had uh, a Negro League team um, that played for a while, but, but a really interesting thing happened here. Uh, William Clarence Matthews, uh, who was a black player, played for the Burlington Northern League team, and the Northern League was professional baseball, and this was in 1905. And of course, he was the only black player playing wow. in professional baseball at the time, and he was playing right here in Burlington, right on this site. All right, and you also brought another very interesting artifact. What is this? This is a 19th century baseball. Um, wow. So this baseball was used in a Northern League game between the Mountaineers and the Rustics. Huh. And so the Mountaineers coming out of Montpelier, uh, Barry Montpelier, way back then, still today, uh, was a professional baseball team. Um, this particular baseball was used in 1876. So a little earlier, this park was built in 1887. Um, but this is what a baseball looked like. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the pieces that we have in our collection at the Vermont Historical Society. When did uh, UVM and, and baseball in general move from the Athletic Park to Centennial Field? Sure, Centennial Field was built in 1906. At that point, okay. this park was abandoned and they had beautiful, spacious digs at Centennial Field. That's on this place in history with the Vermont Historical Society. So you can see that was the very first episode. This place in history. And um, so, I was paired with one of the morning anchors, and uh, we didn't have a cameraman, so the other morning anchor came along and filmed, and you could see it was done with a handheld camera. There was no um, tripod, so it kind of moved around. She zoomed in and out. Kind of the funny story on this one was that she was wearing her morning anchor stuff plus high heels and could, like, was having trouble balancing on the stone wall next to us um, to try to film this, you know, right next to Riverside Avenue. It's not the most convenient place to, um, to film, but we had to get that, that spot. Um, so it was really important that we be in the spot. It was this place in history. It's not this person in history, not this story in history, but this place in history. So we always wanted to be in a place um, when we film. The very early ones, I did bring artifacts from the museum, but we really quickly learned that it was, it was really hard to transport them, maybe not the safest thing to have them out on the side of the road. And um, as it became more popular, um, you know, just my time in trying to research these things and then also pull out um, artifacts was difficult. So um, as we moved on in the program, you'll see less and less artifacts that I bring with me, and instead we try to go um, to artifacts. 
The other problem when we first started the program and working with, with this is Mike Kirkhoff, great guy, um, but he was the anchor of the morning show. And so he had to get to the station at 3 a.m. And so he had to do, then do the morning show. And on these two stations, that's four hours on air. Um, so it's all the prep, and then they're on air for four hours. Um, and so I would meet them at the station at around 9.15. They'd just be coming out of the studio, and we'd hop in a station car and then go film two, three of these segments. And that was really hard on him. And really, we couldn't get much further than 30 minutes away from this um, from the station. So you see kind of in the, the first six months, really, of our program, well, first maybe four months of our program, all of the all of them are kind of Chittenden County, Southern Franklin County, uh, Washington County, wherever we could get quickly so Mike could get home um, and get to bed. Well, Mike ended up leaving the station, and I found this is kind of normal for a lot of television stations, and uh, got a, a job as an anchor in Milwaukee. Um, so I got paired up with Elena Pinto, and um, they found that this was starting to become really popular. The program was really popular. We got a lot of great feedback into the station that folks were watching it. And the station manager decided to put more asset into the program. Um, and in that, he assigned an actual cameraman, um, what was a cameraman at the time, to, to this program. Um, so we had a professional photographer doing the photography work for us. And then um, with pairing with Elena Pinto, they had this um, program where they had a, a morning correspondent who would travel around the state and do live broadcasts, usually four days a week, um, from all these different places uh, around the state. And one of her programs was called Cool Schools, and schools could apply to be on TV at the start of the school day. And so what we decided was, at least while I was working with Elena, that, oh, wouldn't it be great, wherever she's doing a cool school program in the state, then we could film some this place in history. They'd already be there. She'd already have a cameraman with her. So it was helpful to me because it kind of took that um, pressure off of me of deciding where are we going to go next. I knew where we were going. I then had to find what the program was. Um, so this is a program, another early program. I worked with Elena for the balance of 2016, um, and she was doing cool schools in Glover. And um, we decided to uh, film at this site. Actually, this is, this is one of my favorite um, pieces because it was so fun to learn about, and the story is just absolutely bonkers. I think most of you know this story, but here we go. At this place in history, we are in Glover and we should be underwater. I'm with the executive director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins. So we're, yeah, I, we might, we should swim. We should right? swim? Well, we're on the bottom. Yes. Oh, okay. So we're uh, all the way up Looking there. up. We would be 100 feet underwater in 1810. Oh. So this is the site of what was called Long Pond, mm -hmm. and it's now called Runaway Pond. Where did it run away to? So it ran away to the north. But So this was full of water. I mean, you can look around us, and you see yeah. all these hillsides. That was the shoreline of this lake that we're now standing on the bottom of. It was about 100 feet deep and about a mile or so long. Mm -hmm. And so there's some guys who lived north of here, mm -hmm. and they had a... A, a mill mm -hmm. and they just a guy's name was Wilson okay. and he decided I need more power to my it was a really dry summer so mm -hmm. we'll go we need more power so we need more water mm -hmm. so let's go up and at the north end of this lake let's just dig a little channel we'll let some water over it it'll come through it'll come down the Barton River and it'll run our mill mm -hmm. so they dug their little channel well the channel started breaking away mm -hmm. and you know there were some geologic problems anyway the earth started undermining oh. the whole north face mm -hmm. of this pond or lake mm -hmm. let go oh no 75 foot high wall of water goes tearing north along the barton river valley two billion gallons of water screaming in eight hours goes this lake just empties mm -hmm. and all this water goes all the way to lake memphermagog which is a big lake yeah. that lake rose by a foot because of all the water that was let go so each year in june the town of glover celebrates this runaway pond and so you know in 2010 they had a bicentennial oh. of the runaway pond huh interesting all right well mark down your your calendars to celebrate in June in Glover at this place in history. So Runaway Pond, another place you can you can go and visit and, and check out. Uh, 
This was a really hard speech to, to prepare for, and, and most of it is just me showing you videos, but we made so many videos. Uh, we could be here for hours and hours and hours, so selecting them was difficult. So I'm trying to, to march through kind of a little timeline of what we produced. Um, so that was Runaway Pond. Uh, the station always edited everything we did, so sometimes maybe we would talk for 20 minutes, half an hour, and um, some of you in this room we've even interviewed for the program, and you know that you're, you get cut down to about three minutes. The goal is always a three minutes um, on, on these segments. Um, more and more people were responding positively to this segment, and they actually saw a bump in their ratings um, for this morning show on Thursdays. And it was the only thing different that was being done on Thursday. So um, attributed it to this segment. Um, so when Elena left, she got a job as an anchor in Boston. Um, they decided to assign somebody um, to this uh, program and give them a day off. So they assigned Amanda Tebow, who was the morning meteorologist at the time. She later became the chief meteorologist. Um, but the deal was that they gave her one Friday a month away from meteorological duties and just assigned to doing this program. Um, and so they assigned her and a photographer uh, one, we got one day a week, or one, one day a month. Um, and so I would then start planning. That allowed us to go much further afield um, because we didn't have to deal with the TV schedule. Um, we just uh, worked around what we could get done on a Friday. Um, so loved working with Amanda. Amanda's the person I worked with the longest on this program. Um, so she, she left the TV business a, a couple of years ago after having a, a, a baby. Um, but I, the bulk of our programs were done with Amanda. Generally, we always try to film our segments in places where you can go. Um, that's the goal, is that the public will watch these segments and want to go there and learn more or visit just because it's really cool. You can see how excited I am about these programs. I have a lot of fun traveling around the state and learning new things. Um, sometimes we go to places where maybe you don't get to go, but we just feel like we have to get it on camera. And so one of those places, um, well, two, I had two videos. I cut one for time today. One was Nolaka, um, which is Roger Kipling's home in Dummerston. You can actually go there, but you have to rent it. Um, but it's, it's really cool if you want to go see Nalaka or go online and watch our video on Nalaka. But I wanted to show this one on the Hartness House um, in Springfield. And so uh, there was a lot to cover in this piece, um, but the, at the time, the hotel and conference center had closed. It had just been purchased by an out-of-state couple. Um, they were looking to redevelop it, and it had been closed for a while. We were just coming out of the pandemic, actually, when we, we filmed this. And serendipitously, I got in touch with the woman who bought it. She happened to be in Boston. I got her on her cell phone, and she came up just to open the place up so we could go in. And you'll see why we wanted to go in. And we just didn't go into the hotel. We, we got to see some other really cool stuff that the public hardly ever gets to see. Local news that matters on Local 22 News. At this place in history, we're in Springfield with Executive Director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins. Now, Steve, we visited the American Precision Museum a couple of years ago, but we're back talking about the Precision Valley and innovation once more. We are indeed, and we're going to touch on really kind of one of the big movers and shakers in creating the Precision Valley, which, I mean, it was the Silicon Valley of its time right here in Vermont. So who is this person? So James Hartness. I think everyone can read this <laughs> right. over our shoulder. So um, he's always talked about as James Hartness, governor of Vermont. I mean, his career encompassed so many other things. And um, he was really this Renaissance man when it came to kind of mechanical engineering. He wasn't born in Vermont. He was born in Schenectady, um, grew up in Ohio, um, worked in Massachusetts in the kind of machine tool industry down there. Um, but then kind of early in his career, ended up moving here to Springfield. Hartness made his fortune by inventing a lot of these tools, especially the flat turret lathe. Don't ask me to describe exactly how it works, <laughs> um, but this was a real leap forward in machine tools. Um, and he, uh, he, he made a lot of money off of this patent, which his firm then manufactured and shipped all over the world. So we're outside of his house. And when I think of a turn of the century inventor, I can imagine a structure just like the one behind us. It's really mysterious what happened in there. What is that? What's going on? Uh, this is probably my favorite part <laughs> why I really, really wanted to come to Springfield today. That's an 
observatory. Equatorial telescope is the exact terminology for that. A traditional observatory of the time had all of the mechanics and everything above ground. It was cold in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a number of technical reasons why he built it this way, but one of the big ones was that he could be inside underground <laughs> and using this telescope in, in any sort of weather um, and not be exposed to this. So it was comfortable. And what's really cool is that telescope is connected to his mansion over here by a series of underground rooms and tunnels. Okay, let's see, I'm keeping tabs here. We have machinery or manufacturing, we have astronomy. You mentioned politics, can we talk about that? We can absolutely talk about politics. Um, so he ran for and won election as a Vermont governor. He only served one term, a, a two year term. He ran on the idea that um, Vermonters, too many Vermonters were leaving the state. Sound, sound familiar? Mm, yes. And that the jobs that industry would bring, as well as good transportation, good roads, airports, airplanes, would all lift the state up. And so that's what he ran on. Anything else we can add to his resume? Well, we talked about airplanes. <laughs> he felt that the roads in Vermont needed to be improved, but even more so, he said the future is in aviation. Hmm. He got an aviator's license in 1914. He was wow. one of the very first people to get that license, and he got it on a right flyer a Wright biplane made by the That's Wright awesome. brothers. <laughs> so he loved aviation um, and he built on, you know, with his own money the first airport in Vermont. It was actually called the Springfield Aerodrome um, right here in Springfield and it's now the Harkness State Airport. At this place in history. Local news that matters on Local 22 News. That was a really cool trip. Um, and it was really interesting to learn about James Harkness, a very, as you can tell, very fascinating fellow. And his daughter was a folklorist. She's probably better well known than he is at this point. And we did a piece on her as well. So you could, you could check out um, and read about uh, Helen uh, Harkness Flanders, um, as she was known professionally after being married. Uh, we had to cut so much to get that down to three minutes. Um, but the tunnels weren't just the tunnels. They, they had rooms in them. There was a bar in there <laughs> during Prohibition. Um, so there was a bar in there. Um, there were bedrooms in there. We don't want to happening in there. Um, and um, you saw images of old telescopes when I was talking about the turret lathe. I was a little upset how they cut that piece together because those weren't turret lathes that you were looking at in those imagery. Um, they were telescopes. The Stellophane Society um, maintains a collection of, of antique um, technology ar around, um, you know, astronomy and um, the telescopes and that sort of thing. Um, and there is a museum underground in some of those um, tunnels and whatnot. At the time it was closed, the new owner wasn't even sure if she was going to allow anyone in there. They, there was no contract with the Stellophane Society. It was just something that had always been allowed to be there. There were fire code issues. So I'm not even sure where that stands um, at this point. But um, the, and the telescope's in pretty bad shape. But we were able to get in there and, and film it and document it. It was a super day and a lot of fun visiting uh, Springfield. So we usually plan our visits meticulously. So I often spend a day or two of my time um, doing research, uh, um, you know, pulling out images, finding materials that can inform the piece. And I will also let you into a little secret. I research these things so I can talk about them for about five minutes. I am not an expert on all these topics, and often I forget everything that I learned to do the piece like three days later. So it's been fascinating, but um, I get a lot of calls asking me to come speak on a topic. I'm like, I can talk for five minutes. Um, Uh, so some pieces come along serendipitously. Uh, we had a, kind of, it was a really actually long, hot day of filming in Rutland, and we were on our way back to the station, and Route 7, as it usually is, was under construction. And, um, and we got stuck in Pittsford, and just in traffic. And we looked over to our left. We were heading north, and there's a monument there, a marble monument. Of course, we drive by it all the time. What is that marble monument? There's a marble monument. There's no green state sign, just the marble monument. So it's, shoot, we're stuck in traffic. Why don't we hop out? 
So we grabbed the camera and we hopped out. As you can see, the preview image here, Amanda had even changed. That's not what she had worn um, for, for filming. Um, and we said, hey, let's film an intro here and an exit here. And then I'll go do some research and we'll find somebody to talk to and we'll figure out um, what this thing is. So sometimes these stories come about serendipitously and sometimes they're some of our best stories. At this place in history, we're on Route 7 in Pittsburgh. I'm with Executive Director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins. And this monument, people drive by it all the time. What is it for? I know. I've driven by this so many times, <laughs> yeah. too. And it was erected by the town of Pittsburgh. And it's just the site of Fort Vengeance, Ooh. which was built in 1780. So we're talking American Revolution. Now, Vermont has all sorts of monuments like this along the sides of the roads, and you drive by them. So it's so cool to take a time to stop and look. So Amanda, we've come back to the studio here. I made some phone calls and we found Bill Powers who has joined us. He's a, a historian. He's done a fair amount of research on Fort Vengeance. And so I know we have questions, so let's get them answered. Well, in the 1770s, after Burgoyne came through with his troops and devastated the area, so there was a string of forts that ran from uh, Fort Warren and Castleton, Fort Vengeance in Pittsford, which was built, and then over the Green Mountains to the Royalton area where there were other forts. And they said, we can't uh, protect you above that line, so recede, head south, and we can protect you from there. That was the initial thought for having the Fort Vengeance built. What did it look like? It was merely a palisade fort with trees cut down and a palisade built around a, uh, about an acre or more of land. It contained about 150. So there was a name that was very prominent on the monument that we saw in Pittsburgh, Caleb Houghton, is that correct? Correct. Who is that? Technically, that monument in Pittsburgh is the Caleb Houghton Monument, mm -hmm. and it was established on the site of Fort Vengeance. Caleb Houghton was a soldier stationed there at Fort Vengeance and he had gone down to visit a house where Mrs. Sarah Cox June was doing his laundry. But on the way back from that house, he was attacked and killed by an Indian about a half a mile south of Fort Vengeance. When uh, Ebenezer Allen, who was the commander of the fort and was responsible for building the fort, heard about this, he took a rum bottle and smashed it against the uh, gate to the fort and vowed vengeance because of what they had done to Caleb Houghton. And that's how Fort Vengeance got us into did the troops in the fort see much action? Not really. The fort was never attacked. The fort was built in the spring of 1780. It was basically finished by the summer, probably except for the uh, except for the brickwork for the furnaces, and it lasted till about 1782. Nothing really significant happened there in the big picture, but uh, they thought it was pretty important to protect them from any invasion that might come back down from Canada. The fort was built on Caleb Hindy's property, and he went back and uh, occupied the uh, fort site again on his property, and he, he probably disassembled it. Dr. A. M. Caverly was a uh, resident of Pittsburgh, and he wrote the history of Pittsburgh in 1872. He kind of resurrected the memory of Fort Vengeance, if you will. As a result, they erected the monument in 1783, had all kinds of dignitaries there. There was photographs taken and uh, by C.W. Nichols in Rutland. So there was a big celebration. It happened in August of uh, 1873. When Route 7 was widened, the monument got moved a little bit. They also did a full archaeological survey of the site. These are some objects that we pulled out. We have a 1746 Spanish silver uh, real. Wow. These were used by uh, troops as a form of currency uh, in the American colonies. We have some early Masonic cufflinks. Some basket weave buttons, they're very similar to basket weave buttons that were found in uh, Mackinac and what's now Michigan. And then this is a 1772 British halfpenny. So certainly from that time period of the forts. So if people want to learn more about Fort Vengeance or other forts from that time period or that region, where should they go? Where can they go? Well, you want to know more about Fort Vengeance, come to the Pittsburgh Historical Society. We have a wonderful display. We have a wonderful museum. So that's the story of Fort Vengeance. At this place in history.
course, as you can see, we, we filmed the, and that's Fort Vengeance. We had no idea what Fort Vengeance was. Um, <laughs> when we filmed that but again uh, you know one of the great ways to do this program and as you could see as we got really you know kind of uh, more comfortable doing these programs reaching out and sh uh, shining a light on the local experts for each of the areas uh, that we're visiting so it's not just me doing a talking head piece sometimes we had to do that um, but trying to shine a light on some of the the local experts in town and then driving people to their institutions so um, like I said, we had kind of one, we have one day a month where we have to that we have to film, um, and it's always an interesting conversation when I reach out to a local historical society or a town and, and say, hey, you know, in two weeks we have the opportunity to come down and film, and we want to do some stories, and they're like, oh, oh, but could you come on Thursday or maybe the next week? I'm like, no, nah, I really have this Friday, and then. You know, sometimes they get upset if we can't be, be flexible, but that's the reason we get one day a month. That also means we have to film in whatever conditions uh, we have. So we filmed in the driving rain, and we filmed in the beating heat, and we filmed in the absolute bitter cold. Um, so this next one here uh, was filmed in January of 2017. Um, it was filmed in Weybridge. On the day we filmed that, it was minus five degrees at the time that we were out um, doing that. And Amanda had this little wi wind thing that she brings around for weather that was trying to get us wind chill. And we were at approximately minus 20 um, in wind chill. We did this in one take. This was, there was very little editing on the audio of this because we were so cold. I think my face was frozen um, in that shape, but we will go out in any weather. At this place in history, we're in Weybridge, Vermont with Steve Perkins, the executive director of the Vermont Historical Society. Steve, what are we doing in Weybridge? So we're at a sign here for Silas Wright, and you may be saying, Who's Silas Wright? It's one of those cool places in Vermont where we put up monuments, we remember people who are really famous in their time, but history is somewhat forgotten. So Silas Wright, he was born in Massachusetts. Why are we in Weybridge? Well, <laughs> he moved to Weybridge when he was one years old and he grew up here. He went to Middlebury College, graduated in 1811. So we're talking a long time ago, but ultimately he went to New York. He uh, became a lawyer, he became a congressman, he fought in the War of 1812, he became a brigadier general, and then a senator, and very well-respected friends with um, you know, Andrew Jackson and President Martin Van Buren. So he was very, very important. He was very much involved in the U.S. National Bank, um, the whole idea of manifest destiny, how are we expanding into the Western United States. Um, he was an interesting Northern Democrat because he was against slavery. So he, he worked um, against slavery expanding into Western states. Western states remember him. There's a number of counties actually in the Midwest that are named after Silas Wright. So there's Silas Wright. Um, he died young. So he retired. Uh, he, he lost an election uh, as governor of the state of New York. And so he retired to his farm in Canton, which is over in St. Lawrence County, um, but only died a year later. The people of Weybridge wanted to remember him because he was this great, you know, native son of the town. So they commissioned a really big marble monument. And so there's this beautiful monument right in the middle of Weybridge um, to remember Silas Wright. And so they put this up in around 1850 and Martin Van Buren came and he spoke, you know, former president of the United States at the dedication. Um, and then the monument also has these beautiful marble um, busts or, or frieze uh, of Silas Wright. And they were created by um, a pretty well-known American sculptor, Erastus Dow Palmer. Um, so it, it's a beautiful piece of, of American artwork. So you can stop by Weybridge, check these out. Palmer did a, a couple of, of sculptures that are in the Metropolitan Museum of Art right now. One's called The White Captive. The other one's called uh, The Birth of Christianity. Um, so check them out. They're pretty cool, but all right here in Weybridge. And so now what's the most famous part about this monument to Silas Wright? It's the monument for Monument Farms Dairy. So a lot of people love Monument Farms Dairy milk and certainly their chocolate milk <laughs> is super, super good. And uh, you can buy that all throughout the Champlain Valley. But the monument in Monument Farms Dairy is this monument to Silas Wright. Excellent. So come enjoy some chocolate milk and check out this place in Vermont history. So how many people knew that the Silas Wright monument was the monument for Monument Farms Dairy? 
a couple, right? Superstars, superstars, probably from Madison County. <laughs> we had our fair share of technical issues as well. Um, and, you know, wind, light, you know, a photographer shows up and we're like all the way down, we're down in Newfane um, last year at about this time. And we went to film in their brand new museum, which was the old jail. And uh, we get in there and the, and the photographer is like, I was like, what's going on? He said, I forgot the batteries for the lights. <laughs> so we had to film everything like in the front room where we had some light coming in from, from the windows and we didn't get to show a lot of the really cool stuff because there was no way we were driving three hours back to Colchester uh, to get the specialized batteries they need for this weird light that mounts on the top of their, their camera. So that's happened and all the time audio issues. Um, Mike's hardly ever work. I don't know what's what's going on. Um, and maybe it's just our program, but uh, we can never seem to get them to work. Uh, so this next episode is an extreme example of that. And I also wanted to show this episode because it is the second most searched episode uh, when we do our web metrics. And so um, I think over 10,000 or 20,000 views on this, um, this next episode. Um, it's on the Fenian raids. But um, we filmed the whole thing um, up on the side of the road in Franklin County, and uh, I got a call two days later saying, we don't have any audio. The microphones weren't on. I'm like, oh my goodness. We can't go back and do this. We need to cut it. And so uh, Amanda, whose husband um, also does film production and had a home studio, said, let me see what I can salvage from the shotgun mic. And so the shotgun mic is that microphone that's attached to the camera and we always leave it on and it catches that ambient sound. And so they can turn that ambient sound down or up depending on what, what we want to you know, give for ambiance of our, of our piece. Um, so all we had was the audio from that shotgun uh, mic. So he was able to salvage the audio. You'll hear that the audio is a little weird on this, but it is one of our most viewed um, episodes. At this place in history, we're in Sheldon with the executive director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins, and we're standing on the side of 105. You're holding a firearm. I don't know what is going on here. And I'm wearing green, so we must be invading Canada. Clearly. So that's what we're talking <laughs> right? about today. So our topic are the, is the Fenian Raids of Canada. There were two raids, uh, one in 1866 and one in 1870, but it, it goes back to really the 1850s. You started to see a lot of tension between England or Great Britain and Ireland. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, a huge group of Irish immigrants that are living, many of them in the United States, who are yearning for a free Irish homeland. Now the American Civil War comes around and a lot of these folks are organized into military units based on ethnicity. So you get Irish brigades. There was even an Irish um, company out of Burlington. They come up with this grand plan that they will invade Canada, which was part of Great Britain at the time, and hopefully by doing that, it'll help convince Great Britain that they need to let Ireland be a free and independent republic. So in 1866, they, they did uh, invade Canada. And there was one pretty famous battle over from New York uh, into what's now Ontario. And the Fenians won that initial battle, but of course more British troops came in and they ended up retreating. Also in 1866, you had some troops that had come through Vermont to go into the eastern townships. They would take the train to St. Albans and then uh, kind of muster there and then take the train on the Missisquoi Valley Railroad here to Shelton Depot. And then they would have marched due north. So in 1866, they went there, and they were there for a little over a week, yucking it up, <laughs> destroying property, oh eating whatever they could find, and generally making life not grand for mm -hmm. the residents of the eastern townships, until finally some troops came over from Montreal and, and kicked them out. But in 1870, they decided, we're going to invade again. Mm -hmm. Now at this point, eastern townships have created a home guard of um, well-trained, uh, you know, volunteers from the area to repel any attack. And so that's what happened. So the Canadians set up on what a hill called Eccles Hill that has a great view into the United States. They set up there with, with sharpshooters and they waited for the Fenians to line up 
and cross the border. They, you know, let loose a volley, and what happens? Uh, you know, one Fenian dies, a second one died a, a little bit later. Everyone else turns around, books it out of there. They, they go running back. So this rifle right here, actually some sort of musket, um, was used by the Fenians. It's surplus Civil War, and it was dropped in Franklin as they were retreating uh, wow. and retrieved and placed in the Vermont Historical Society. But I mean, it happened right here. I mean, we're, we're standing on the That's side so of crazy. We're standing, standing on the side of Route 105, um, major transportation route back and forth to Canada. That's why they came this direction. Um, but a little kind of mini war between Irish, the Irish Republican Army, and British forces at this place in history. So I think a lot of people doing research, yeah, really use these these segments. And I think because they are archived and placed um, on it's on our YouTube channel by Vermont Historical Society, it does something with the Google algorithms. A lot of these come up as primary source material when people do, or not primary source, but a primary search result uh, when people do a search. Um, so there are a lot of bigger themes in US history that folks around the country are doing um, research on. Our video comes up first. So we get contacted by a lot, especially kids doing research. Tell me, Thaddeus Stevens is by far um, our most viewed video. So we get a lot of questions about Thaddeus Stevens. And that's the one where, can you come and speak to our conference about Thaddeus Stevens? I'm like, I can talk for five minutes about Thaddeus Stevens. Um, very much not an expert on Thaddeus Stevens, but a lot of people are researching him right now. Um, of course, we all know what happened in 2020 and the, the pandemic hit and it made it a little hard to get out and do these videos uh, in the field. Um, I, I was not cleared. There was a company policy at the TV station, so I couldn't travel in the vehicle with the um, with the reporter and the, um, the cameraman. And for a while, they actually having the reporter and the cameraman travel separately in two different vehicles uh, when they were doing um, filming. Um, so we kind of took a break. So we didn't produce a lot of film in um, kind of the, the middle of 2020 until things started to calm down uh, a little bit. Um, but we did get creative and um, I had a couple of ideas. One was we can revisit stories. So I can pull objects from the museum and film myself talking about artifacts that relate to previous stories and so they recut other stories so if you're looking at some of our videos online you may see the recut version that has artifacts in it that wasn't in the original airing so um, we did that um, we also uh, we we refilmed a few because if you can imagine maybe I got something wrong um, and folks would definitely let me know if I got something wrong so uh, we would refilm re refilm things um, and uh, the, probably the most important important one that we refilmed was on Dinah, who was an enslaved woman um, in Windsor. And I think most people know the story um, of Dinah. I was going to show that today, but I, you know, I, we're rapidly running out of time here. Um, go online and check that out. I recut it. Um, there was some criticism from the some people in the town of, of Windsor that felt that I wasn't treating Stephen Jacob, the person who purchased a, another person fairly. You can see where my feelings lie on that. Um, so um, I, I tried to treat the new piece a little more even handedly and, and just present the evidence and, and the documentation um, around that case. Um, but definitely go check that one out um, online. Um, but I also said, hey, I got this old digital SLR camera at home. I got my kids that have nothing left to do. Why don't we go film something in my backyard? Um, so we went out and we filmed some pieces at my house. And uh, this was a piece that uh, we filmed as kind of more like doing history, how to find history wherever you go um, in the state. And I, my daughter absolutely loved it. And she loved that she saw it on TV um, once it was finished. Local news that matters on Local 22 News. At this place in history, we're heading to Williston to join Executive Director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins, on a tour of history you might be able to find in your favorite hiking spot, neighborhood, or even your own backyard. Behind the lens, Steve's 13-year-old daughter, Celia. Let's check in with them. I'm Steve Perkins, the Executive Director of the Vermont Historical Society, and we're doing this a little different today. We're doing this from home. So I'm out behind my house in an old field, but wanted to talk today about some things that you can find to see a bit of history right where you live. 
So as most people probably don't know, Vermont was almost completely tree free in the 19th century. That means almost no trees in the entire state of Vermont and humans had impacted the land in many different ways. So right behind me, we're looking at a very Vermont thing a stone wall. Stone walls were found throughout the state. It was an easy way of marking boundaries. You got the stones out of the fields as you cleared them and created somewhat of a barrier for livestock. So as you're walking through the woods today, you can find stone walls all over the place. And when you see a stone wall, know that that stone wall in the woods wasn't in the woods when it was built. It was marking the edge of a field. Now we're at another feature on the farm. We're looking at a really old road, but you can see the landscape falls away, but it flattens out right in this spot. So again, as you're hiking through the woods, as you're looking at these trails, look at how wide they are. Look at where a slope comes down. It may flatten and then drop again, and you may be looking at old roads. Again, lots and lots of old roads in Vermont, and they're super fun to explore. You can even get a really old map and follow those old roads as trails through the forest. Vermont was covered with little towns and villages all through the mountains and through the valleys that are no longer there anymore. The people have upped and left and the buildings are gone, but often you can still find the cellar hole. So look for square depressions in the ground when you're walking through the forest. But also, here's a real tip. Look for lilac bushes. Often people of mainly English extraction who are building villages in Vermont put lilacs on the corners of their houses. We still do that today. It's really beautiful. Um, but this is a dead giveaway that this was a cellar hole and not just a sinkhole in the woods. So we're gonna end this little tour in a pretty easy one. You can often find old pieces of equipment out in the woods, whether it's farm equipment, mining equipment. This one, a tree grew right through it. So a lot of fun things to find as you're walking through the Vermont woods, things you can do by yourself to see how people made history right there. So I'm sure my, my 17, almost 18 year old daughter would probably be mortified that I called her out um, on that, but uh, we, we had a lot of fun filming spots you know, a, around our house and she had some good, um, good ideas. The other thing that we did during the pandemic was create a real archive um, of all of these spots. So um, our contract stated that the, or the original contract stated that the television station would keep them on their website and we just linked to them. And so we had these permanent links to the video on the station's website. By the time we got to 2020, those links were starting to disappear. And the older pieces, the ones that we created in 2016 and 2017, were starting to disappear. And no one could get them back. They were just gone. And so I was maybe freaking out a little bit, saying, we need to protect these. And so Steve Longchamp, who was our longtime um, photographer, um, took it on as a project. And so he went through all the servers at the station, desktop computers, um, digging up the raw video that he could find from all of these early pieces. And he filled a rather large hard drive with it and we handed it off in the old friendlies parking lot in uh, in Williston you know covering our mouths and everything while, while, while we did that um, so that we could then um, upload all of those videos to our own channel and archive them at the Vermont Historical Society. Um, so now we archive all of them because the, the TV station really just, or this particular station really doesn't. Um, so um, they're all available on our YouTube channel and we have an interactive map, which I'll show you um, at the end for exploring um, all of the videos. But that was another thing that came um, out of the pandemic. Um, oh, I will let you know that the, the most hate mail I've ever received um, about a piece was when we did a piece on Vermont made. Um, you know the Vermont made syrup? Yep, table syrup, it's corn syrup mixed with a little bit of maple syrup. Well, it was invented in Vermont. People were so mad that I would publicize on television that Vermont made not pure maple syrup was actually developed in Vermont and up until the 1970s canned and shipped out of Burlington. On the other hand, we did one on Maltex, um, and which also made a cereal called Maypo, which my mother loves. And it's hard to find Maypo now. It's, it's, it's still being produced, but it's hard to find it in Vermont. And I stated that on air. 
I had a box, a case of Mapo show up at the History Center with a note that it was for my mother. And it was, um, it was from the company. They, they picked up the story on, online. They were very happy we did the story, and they sent me a case of Mapo to give to my mother, who was also um, very happy that we did that. So I have a couple more, if you'll bear with me, just a couple more to, to show you, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. But um, traveling around the state can be really delicious. And um, that's something I really enjoy. And so we've, we've been all over the state. And again, Steve Longchamp, this, uh, he's now retired, the photographer that was with us. He was with CAX for years, and then he was with this, um, this station here until the end of his career. So he had a lot of knowledge. We called him Diner Steve. And he knew every little hole in the wall place to eat. And he always would direct us to the most delicious lunch um, that we would have when we were out in the field. And invariably, he would know the owner, the cook, or the server um, that we were running into um, at, at all of those places. Um, and then just kind of one, one story about Island Pond. I know that was on the trivia here, Island, Island Pond. So um, we were in Island Pond in the town of blank. And <laughs> We had finished filming and we're looking to go get lunch. And I, I don't know why all the restaurants in Island Pond are closed on a Friday, but they were. There wasn't anything open. And so we were walking down Main Street, kind of like looking in windows. And there was this little barbecue place um, uh, right on Main Street. Those of you up from that area may, may know it. Um, and looking in, and there was a guy in the back. And he just starts waving at us. And we're like, oh, no, 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 you're closed. He comes running out. He's like, how can I help you, gentlemen? I said, oh, no, we were just looking for lunch. We see you're closed. Not a problem. I'm, I've got some pork on the smoker. I'm getting ready for a party. I'll feed you. Come on in. Why are you in Island Pond? So he makes us up some plates, plates of food, just, you know, whatever he happened to be cooking in the back. And we, we sit down. I think I had, had ribs. And Mike Hoey, who was my co-host at the time, had a, a pulled pork sandwich. And he, and, he, and he sits down. And we tell him about the program. He said, oh, that sounds great. And, of course, one of the questions I always get when I travel around the state for better or for worse, is are you from Vermont? <laughs> or are you a Vermont, or whatever that means. So am I from Vermont? Am I from, yes, I was born in Vermont. So I was born in uh, uh, at a hospital in Newport, but my family lived in Canaan. And as you know, you're not giving too much away on the trivia here, Island Pond's not too far away from Canaan. And, and so I said that, because when I'm traveling in the Northeast Kingdom, there are my bona fides, right? My parents lived in Canaan when I was born. And, uh, Oh, well, what's your name again? Steve Perkins. Well, what's your parents' name? Also Steve Perkins and, and Brenda Perkins. And um, huh, I knew a Steve Perkins. What'd your dad do? So well, he was the, at the time, he was the music teacher at Canaan High School. Oh, Mr. Perkins, by Jesus, he tried to teach me how to play the clarinet. It didn't really work. So there are your connections in Vermont that we run into in, in every piece. And just as an aside, we filmed in Canaan a year later, and his brother was uh, the one who we interviewed. <laughs> we, also got to film, we also got to film some pieces on food. And I would like to do more on, on food. So you know, certainly the beer ones were fun. We did the kind of the craft beer revolution from the early 90s at Vermont Pub and Brewery. We went up to Hill Farmstead because he names all his beers after the history of Greensboro. I don't know if you know that. If you see all the names on his beers, they relate to his family and the history of that area. That was lots of fun. Gave me a whole case of beer. That was cool. Um, and um, uh, Venetian ginger ale was another lots of fun, connecting past to present there. Um, and then this one. Uh, which, which was great. And it was a great way to end the day because I was really hungry by the time we got in to filming uh, this piece. At this place in history, we're in Rutland with Executive Director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins. Steve, I wish we had smell o vision It smells so good here. It does smell so good. So we are going to be exploring crackers today. Crackers have been made in Vermont for a long time. And I think most people know about the Westminster Cracker Company. We're going to go inside and check it out. Where are we right now? We are in uh, Rutland, Vermont, in the House Center at uh, Westminster Cracker Company. And people might recognize that name because... Uh, so if you've ever gone to a restaurant and you've gotten those little 
oyster crackers in the brown and white bags, that's us. We're, we're pretty much everywhere. So most of the time when you go get soups or stuff like that, it's our oyster crackers that you're putting into that soup. So we start off with, we make a sponge and that sponge sits in our proof room for roughly 12 hours. We let our yeast kind of go to work on uh, the different ingredients that we put in there. From there, we then add more flour, uh, salt and sugar, and we make it into a dough. From that dough, it sits another four hours before we run it on one of our two lines. From there, the dough gets extruded out into a sheet, and then we have dyes that stamp out the correct pattern, whether we're making saltine crackers or oyster crackers. They then go into our ovens, they uh, go through our dryer, dry out so that they're nice, dry, crisp crackers, and from there, they go directly to packaging. So from the time we actually bake the crackers to packaging, it's usually anywhere between 20 minutes to 45 minutes, and they're in the package in a case ready to go. Between both lines, we're making about 67 pounds of crackers every minute, okay. and we're running around the clock 24-7. So how much flour does that use then, say, a um, day? We've got three silos that each hold 150,000 pounds. We can only make it a few days without having to refill those silos. And I heard a little rumor there's a unique way you actually get the flour from the rail cars in the building. So we actually pressurize the rail cars with air. Um, they're sealed rail cars that come in. Each one contains 50,000 pounds of flour. And then we blow it out underneath the street through piping. It goes up to the top of the silos before it then gets sifted and it comes into our used bins and it sits there and waits to be used. What can you tell us about the history of the company? So we started out in Westminster, Massachusetts. And then um, eventually the company was bought and moved to Rutland, Vermont. And they started out almost in like a garage back on Ranbury Road. And so from there, uh, they moved to the house center and that's when they bought line one, which is our older line. Uh, from my understanding, they actually found the line. Uh, it's a very old line right before it was uh, thrown into the ocean and it was gonna become an artificial reef because they couldn't find anybody that really wanted to buy it. So uh, this company bought, bought that line and started producing crackers. Uh, they used to only work one shift a day. And uh, they, they weren't as automated. In fact, they pulled the scrap off by hands before it go, went in. And they wanted to make sure every single thing was perfect going with these crackers. And we still continue that today, where we're, we're testing our quality and everything like that. So. I, I stole this off the back here yes. as we came through, right? So it's packaged now in these little plastic yeah. bags. How did these used to get packed? So crackers actually used to go through in these big giant wooden barrels. And that's where one of the terms cracker barrel comes from because that's where crackers are, are shipped out. And it's funny, we actually make the crackers for a cracker barrel still today. So that's pretty, <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. We've been around for over a hundred years. We, we've, it's, a, it's a very simple process, but we do it correctly. And it's just, it's a good product. And you can go out and find it just about anywhere, not only in Vermont, but all up and down the East Coast and all throughout the country. I've really worked up an appetite, Steve. At this place in history. I brought home two whole huge boxes of those crackers. And I, probably two days, my kids had eaten all of them. There is nothing like a fresh, hot oyster cracker right off the line. Delicious. I mean, I like saltines anyway, but they, they were great. So I had two more. I'm just going to do one more so we have enough time for, for questions here. Um, but uh, I'm often surprised at, you know, kind of the stories of truly national significance that are hidden in, in our little state of Vermont. I mean, I think we, we know some well-known stories, but there are a lot of pieces that really relate to our national story that have really important places in Vermont. And this is a relatively recent, this place in history, I think it aired last year, maybe like in November, um, about the Chinese Immigration Detention Center in Richford, um, Vermont. Um, not giving anything away, it's one of those northern towns on the, um, on the trivia sheet. Um, and this is with Mike Hoey. Mike, Mike is the current co-host with me of the piece uh, of this program. At this place in history, we're on Powell Street in Richford with Steve Perkins, the executive director of the Vermont Historical Society. Steve, we're here this week because of something that used to be located right here that an awful lot of people in our region probably have no idea ever existed. Yeah, very true, Mike. And, you know, something of, of national significance right. to the United States and somewhat to Canada as well. Um, and we are standing on the site of what was a Chinese detention center. 
um, and it was here from uh, about 1903 to 1913. So for about a decade, this was one of only four detention centers along the entire land border with Canada. One of the two U.S. presidents to have been born in Vermont had a very significant role in this facility having been built here. <laughs> Absolutely, Mike. So Chester Arthur, um, the year specifically was 1882. Um, the United States Congress passed and he signed into law the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so this is the first and really only time in U.S. history where we've said to one group of people, based on your country of origin, we're completely excluding you, that excluded all Chinese immigration to the United States for a term of 10 years. That was the compromise, and that's why Chester Arthur signed it, because it was a term of only 10 years. It was renewed in 1892, and then in 1902, it was made permanent. Right. Not very long after that is when this detention center would have been Exactly. Built. So then you had to have processing facilities to try to uh, catch and um, send back Chinese immigrants. And a lot of Chinese were trying to come here. Chinese would, would enter Canada, take the Canadian Pacific Railway all the way over here. Richford was one of the busiest border crossings, uh, if not the busiest, in uh, New England at the time. Um, and so it made sense to have a detention facility here. The big immigration ports of San Francisco and New York and Los Angeles, for example, um, all had processing facilities. And ultimately that's what happened here um, and decided at that point to move all Chinese immigration processing to Boston. And then in 1924, it got expanded even more and they started applying quotas to diff other countries and then started taking rights away from Chinese who were already uh, in the country. And it wasn't until 1943 uh, with World War II well underway when China became our ally that the legislature, Congress said, oh, well, maybe we should rethink this. Yeah. So they put a quota of 105 Chinese immigrants a year. Of course, all of this was wiped out in 1964, and we got rid of country by country quotas. The Richford Historical Society has some documentation, including a photograph of uh, an interpreter who worked there, if they, I'm remembering they that did. right. They did, yeah. They in, in, uh, employed uh, Hong Poi, who was uh, an interpreter, to uh, work with the folks as they came through. And they have a a picture of him at the Historical Society, and also it, it, you know, it's, it's a grainy image, but an image of the Chinese detention center with some Chinese nationals um, standing uh, outside of it. So documentation is few and far between, um, but I think it's an important story for us to tell. A story of U.S. immigration policy at this place in history. So they're not always fun in games um, on these, but very important um, stories for, those, for us to know as Vermonters and as citizens of this country. Um, I, I'm not going to show this last one. You can look it up. It's uh, Alberg's Atlas Missile Silo. Did people know that we had Atlas missile sites in Vermont? Two of them, um, Alberg and Swanton. And so we were given permission to film um, at the silo in Alberg. Uh, and so we, we were up there on a very cold day um, filming. So you can go online and, and check that out. But the reason I added it here um, is it's relatively recent. But also, we had an intern um, from UVM with us in the car. It was a communications um, major student who was interning with the TV station and was coming up to work with the camera person that was filming for us that day. And so we were on our way. Where are we going? Oh, we're going to Alberg. And, and Mike was like super excited because we were going to be talking about missiles. And, and like I've never been on a missile site. We get to look down into the control center, which is full of water, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and the student said, well, missiles? Like, like what? And I said, oh, well, it was part of the Cold War. And the student said, what's the Cold War? So part of our mission at the Vermont Historical Society is that we believe an understanding of the past changes lives and builds better communities. That's really important, really important. And I hope that this program inspires people to see history, get excited about history, travel around our state and visit history, um, and, and learn about it. If you don't know what the Cold War is, great, watch the segment and we get some resources at the end on how you can go learn about it. Because it's important and it's really important, especially in what we're talking about in today's world.
So a couple more, just these slides. Here are our top 10 segments. Thaddeus Stevens, Feeney and Raids, Rogers Rangers, Snowflake Bentley. And of course, these uh, um, records only date back to when we created the archive in probably end of 2020, beginning of 2021. First Quito, Quonset Hut, Stephen Douglas, Marquis de Lafayette. You can see these are like keyword searches right on Google that people are doing research for, but they're checking them out and they're, they're constantly being viewed. Um, so this place in history, we've been on air since June 2016. Um, there's a segment that airs every Thursday on channels 22 and 44 during all of their newscasts. Um, so, and that's during every hour of every newscast. So if you start watching at four in the morning, you can watch it every, every hour through the four hour morning show. You can watch it on two different stations for the evening news and you can watch it on two different stations for the late news. We've created 358 segments to date. We've had five different, I've had five different co-hosts and there's over 24 hours of content available um, on our website. That's in three minute segments. Um, rough, well, approximately, um, three to four minute segments. Um, they're all archived at vermonthistory.org slash this place in history. Um, so easiest thing to do is just go to our website. Here's our website. It's actually linked right off the front page, this place in history. And there's a couple of different ways to explore um, sites. So we've got the map. And so, uh, you know, obviously you zoom in and there's more dots than you really see. Um, and you can see parts of the states where we need to spend more time. Um, but you can also see that the stories seem to follow um, traveled, you know, rivers and, and roads as well. So um, you can just do it that way geographically, um, but you can also um, go to this place for history, this place in history for students, and you can click on sections um, by looking it up by uh, category. So abolition, um, which programs relate to abolition, and this is something we provide on our um, Vermont History Explorer website for um, students as well. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of a fun way to go and look at all of our, our segments. I, I'm not sure if like the last couple months are, have been put into this section yet, but they're all on the map. So I encourage you all to go and watch as many as possible. And here's the challenge. I had this long conversation with uh, the late Jack Carter. He said, this is a great program. Now that I've done my 251, he had done 251. I'm sure he went to Essex Junction. But um, 251, I'm now going to go to every site you go to. So I'm not sure if he, he got there. But uh, we're at 358 now. So that's a bit more than 252 now, isn't it? So there's, there's my challenge to, to this club. So thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, you are an amazing storyteller. And I think it's clear by just being here today and then also watching those segments. And I don't, how many did you show? About six to eight here? And nine. nine. And I cannot believe how much I just learned from just watching those nine segments. So thank you so much. And I think Steve said he could take some questions. Um, so if you want to, I can bring, you're easy. I can bring the mic over here. Two questions. Um, are there any segments that when you're old and senile, you'll never forget? They either made your heart sing or broke your heart. And the second question is, is there any place you wanted to go but couldn't because you were denied access or it flooded away or something? Well, I showed you some of my, I, I did show you some of my high points. I'll never forget the very first one you know, we, we ever did. That was absolutely um, a, amazing. The Hartness House was, was really cool. Um, I'll remember that. And like I said, I, I really enjoyed Nalaka. And I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking of like, how can my family rent that and go stay down there um, for a weekend? Um, there's, just, there's so many. It's, it's so fun. And I, and I remember, I, I remember all of them. Um, and it's, it's hard to just pick one. But those are certainly some of some of the high points and then filming one of my daughter <laughs> you know on the back 40 of our farm in, in Williston was lots of fun um, so there's one that we've been meaning to do and we haven't been able to get in for a number of reasons we did get permission from the landowner um, but we couldn't figure out how to get through a locked fence and then we couldn't get through snow and then there was also negotiations with immigration and border control or ice um, so there I'm trying to remember that the 
forgetting the exact name of the guy, um, he created a, a, he invented a, a gun. Bull, thank you. Yep, up in North Troy. And uh, we have permission to film on the site um, of, of his facility there that was creating a gun that theoretically could put a projectile uh, into, into space or ballistically launch um, a, a projectile without a, without a rocket. And so I won't, leave t I won't get into it too much because it's going to be a really cool story once we're able to get in there uh, and, and tell it. I mean, intrigue and the Mossad and Saddam Hussein and Canadian Defense Department, the U.S. Defense Department. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating story, and I think once we get a generation on, I think more will even even come out because there's still a lot of people that don't want to talk about um, what went on um, in the development of that weapon right here uh, in Vermont. So that's that's one, and I am just it's it's been on my list. We gotta go there. We gotta go there. We gotta go there. Yeah, she wanted to know if I'd seen the, the, the latest movie by Jay Craven. And in fact, I am, I am supposed to go appear with Jay on Saturday. Um, uh, he's uh, showing it in Williston um, this coming Saturday. So I haven't seen the whole thing. Uh, I was waiting until I watched it uh, with him. He did do research at the Vermont Historical Society. He did chat with me. Um, I had a number of long chats. I think my name's in the credits a, a, a number of times um, as well. I, it's a work of fiction. Um, you know, it's it's a. I haven't seen the whole thing, but I, it's a work of fiction. It's what we call speculative fiction. Uh, like, what if? Could Ethan Allen have met Lucy Terry Prince? Sure, they lived in the same time and they kind of traveled through the same same areas. Um, but you know, beyond that, I, I, I think Ethan Allen needs, in my opinion, needs a more balanced um, presentation. I think. Uh, he's a very important person to Vermont history, um, but there are other folks who were involved in the founding of this state as a political entity that probably had more involved than he did, um, yet he is lifted up as this great hero. And so I think, uh, uh, and this is another story that you know, kind of propagates a lot of that mythology. So I say speculative fiction, it's I'll see it on Saturday. I'm <laughs> sure it's a, it's a fun movie, um, but don't use it as history. Please don't use it as history. Do I think there will ever be another, be a his, another History Expo? I loved History Expo, and I only, had to, I only did one. Um, it's a, it's, I'll be honest with you, money. It's about money. Um, it, uh, on, on a final accounting, uh, it was losing $100,000 every History Expo. Um, we can't absorb, we couldn't absorb that, um, and we couldn't fundraise our way out of that. Um, and so it's not just the cost, that was the loss. Um, so I, I would love to see like a 30th anniversary expo or something where we do like a one-off you know, at a time that, that makes sense and we can make it happen. Um, so, uh, you know, we've had to move on. Um, from it. I'm sad about that. Um, I know. I know. I've talked to a lot of local societies that, that really loved it. Um, but, you know, how can we meet the need of local societies in other ways um, that, that we can afford and stay in business as, a, as an organization? Have I done one on John Deere? Yes. It was like the sixth one that we did. So uh, hop online and check out. And that was back in the day when we were still hauling artifacts around. So I actually had a little patent model for a, a Deere plow that we have in our collection. Um, I think as everybody knows, John Deere was born in Vermont and he uh, worked in Rutland and in Middlebury. Uh, he invented all his stuff out in Indiana. Um, so you know what he's famous for didn't happen in Vermont, but he was, but he's from here. So we'll, we'll, we'll claim that, and yes, I did. So go online on our website and, and check that one out. It's under the dot, is under Middlebury.
So the question is, how far ahead do we plan, and do I ever run out of ideas? And I'm realizing I didn't show you my last slide. My last, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer these in reverse, reverse order. Yeah, I do get stumped. Sometimes I'm like, oh shoot, what are we gonna, what are we gonna do? Because we have to fill up a day. We can't just do one because I only get this crew for a day. So they all have to be in proximity to each other. So we, especially if we're driving three hours to film something, it they all need to be in a relatively close um, spot. Um, so I'm always looking for suggestions. Always looking for a suggestion. So please um, email me. The easiest thing to remember now, we updated our email address, is director at vermonthistory.org. Um, will get to me. Send your suggestions on. And we'd love to have sites that have experts. So if you have something that you want to talk about, a site that, that you are at that we haven't covered, let me know. We'll put you on camera. Right, Dennis? <laughs> we put Dennis on camera. And how far do we plan in advance? I try to plan about six um, episodes in advance, so a couple months in advance. So we just filmed last week up in Cambridge. And so if you watch the program, you may have seen our piece on Wrong Way Bridge. Um, and uh, then there'll be another one on Warren Lodge. And then another one. It's a really unique uh, World War I monument in, in Cambridge. It's, it's in the village of Jeffersonville. Uh, it, it, the way it was created is quite unique. So those were filmed in Cambridge. Then we're going to Westfield um, in, in a few weeks. Um, they contacted me when I put out a, a, a request for um, pieces, and they have a very interesting library and a taxidermy collection there that has a fascinating story. So we'll be heading up to Westfield, um, Vermont. Um, so, yeah, Dennis, do you want to add on to your experiences? <laughs> They, they, they aired, and they're on our website. So go look. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. Sorry. One, one more. I, one in the back here. Hi, hi, hi Elise. Uh, they're. You know what? I'm. I'm not sure if they are. Those were a different. Program. Again, we tried to do a lot of video during the pandemic because we couldn't do these. And we did a cooking show from my kitchen um, on kind of different cultural groups in Vermont and highlighting um, some cuisine from the different groups and making something that we could all cook together, um, you know, in, a, in an hour. And we usually had an alcoholic beverage we made with it as well. They were fun. They were done on Zoom. I think they were recorded so that members could watch them afterwards. So I will check with Amanda and see if those are available. So that's a, a good, good reminder. So yeah, cook, cooking shows. That, that, was, that was new for me. I ran out in my own home kitchen with a webcam. <laughs> Ethan Allen Tower. Yes, that was in the original four that, that we shot. Um, also fun for the, the poor young lady who was trying to film it with a handheld camera and that tower, as you know, has open grates and she was wearing spike heels. So it was, that, was a, that was a special one. We did the tower. We also did the Ethan Allen Homestead as well. So you can watch those in tandem if you would, if you would like to you know, kind of get information on Ethan Allen from two different directions. You want to go with one more? <laughs> We have not. You know, when I talk about bucket list is, well, you know, I, the technology could be difficult on that, um, whether the TV has it. I would love to do that. I was an intern at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum in the late 80s and early 90s and helped work on the creation of the underwater um, preserve in my own special way as an undergraduate intern. Um, but. I would love to. No, we haven't done anything on that. We've done a number of maritime um, from the shore and mentioned, like we mentioned the horse ferry, we mentioned the phoenix, but we didn't go to the, to the wrecks themselves. Well, thank you again, Steve.
And I think, Steve, um, you, so you said you were measuring the Google Analyticals, and I think after this meeting, you're going to see a spike. We have 251 Club members taking a look, and uh, what a great resource for all of us to have as well before we head out on our 251 Club trips to take a look, see if there's been a segment done on it, and, and get that history. So thank you again, Steve, for being here with us today. Okay, so I think up next, I think a board, a board member wanted to say a few words. This is Steve Mason, a board member of the 251 Club of Vermont. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> um, I don't know about you, but I was blown away by Steve's work, and uh, uh, I'm a, I consider myself a Vermont file, uh, a kingdom file mostly. Uh, some of the stories, uh, about the kingdom, and I got a couple of things I'd like to share with uh, with Steve uh, at some point, some contact, if he's gonna be up there, but uh, I got so into his presentation, I forgot what I was supposed to come up here and do. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, rem I've remembered. <laughs> I'm only gonna take, take a few minutes. I, I am gonna throw in a quick story, because this is the story section. But uh, the board, uh, we, we talked, uh, uh, last week, late last week, uh, about how we, uh, there's no sport alert because Stephanie's already revealed that uh, after five years she's going to be leaving the organization. And uh, uh, Hubie and I, another board member, started talking about her accomplishments and I, I was quickly writing on a piece of paper. And you know, I ran out of paper so Hubie kept coming up with ideas, and I said, Hubie, uh, you know, I think I'm just going to tell the people, if you've got the last five years of newsletters, everything you read is because of Stephanie. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating. You know, somebody asked me at the table um, earlier during lunch, um, does, the, does the board do all this? <laughs> and I said, yeah, we have a grand plan, Stephanie. <laughs> uh, just, just um, I'm kind of. This is kind of from the heart because, as a, I've been a board member on a number of organizations and continue to be, and so I've known a lot of executive directors, and sometimes with some of the boards, multiple. Uh, I became a member of five years ago, Stephanie's first year. And I can tell you as a board member, many times as a chair, having worked with many executive directors, the fact that Stephanie is only part-time, I cannot get a grasp of. Um, she does more work than most full-time executive directors, and I can say that from experience, having seen many. Uh, whatever idea the board has, she never says, well, I don't. I think I'm too busy. I can't get to that. She always follows up on it. She'll give her us her exact opinion on something, and it and it's always on spot. Uh, I I could go on for a long time about all of Stephanie's accomplishments. The fact that she's uh, broadened our partnerships around the state. She's brought new organizations. Uh, into the into our organization she's made people aware of what we do um, and during covid she actually expanded our membership um, and and she always comes up with another excuse why it wasn't her and and what that tells me is it was her yeah um, so I, I, on behalf of the board, Stephanie, I, I wanted to thank you from, you know, in all sincerity, from the bottom of my heart, the fact that Stephanie has agreed uh, to stay through the end of the year is another indication of her commitment to the organization. You know, I've, I've, had, or, I've had executive directors call me the night before they were not going to be in the next day because they were done. Uh, rarely does one give us four or five months notice because she was thinking about the organization and, and really all of you. And, and I, 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 she said, 
as she looks out, she's seen many friends. Well, I hope the many people that she sees as friends also consider themselves her friends as well as friends of the organization because we exist just because of you. Uh, and, you know, I saw people taking notes on where they wanted to go next. And uh, I was with you. I'm, I'm, I did the same thing. Uh, I did my uh, 251 50 years ago this year. Um, in 1974, it took me two years and three motorcycles. <laughs> uh, um, but what I learned during that time period, I was uh, in high school, or I just got out of high school, I was in college, I went to St. Mike's, and um, I, I used to give Frank Bryan, some of you may know Frank Bryan, he was my first instructor at St. Mike's. He started at St. Michael's. Uh, he, of course, finished a fabulous career uh, at UVM. Uh, but I come in on Monday morning. His class was my first one Monday morning, and I always use the excuse that I was, I'm late because I was trying to complete my 251. <laughs> and Frank said, "Yeah, yeah, I got you. You're one of two Vermonters who would tell that story." <laughs> um, but this is about Stephanie and. And uh, it's just a great amount of appreciation. Uh, I hope all of you or some of you will step up to Stephanie after this is over and tell her how much, how important uh, she's been um, to you or, and to the organization. Thank you. no idea Steve was coming up today to say all those words or I am speechless but those words meant a lot to me and, and thank you to the board too but um, thank you Steve that really meant a lot so thank you oh okay so now <laughs> moving on um, we usually now open up the mic to 251 club members who have completed their quest um, in 2024 and I know there was somebody who reached out to me Crystal Palmer I believe and if you, I can bring the mic to you, or you can come up this way. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I joined 251 in 1990 or 2019 on the purpose of trying to find what Vermont has to offer. Well, life goes on and it got busy. My father lost his license and by 2020, COVID hit. He's like, the walls are closing in on me. I need something. It's like, well, I belong to 251. Let's go see some towns. Let's find out what Vermont has to offer. Let's see the landscape. Little did I know, 251 gave me a very, very special mark in my life. I got to meet my father and listen to him and his stories. And I saw his face like a two-year-old seeing things for the very first time. And he's a true Vermonter. At 89, he got to see the Battle of Monument, uh, Bennington Monument, um, for the very first time. Wow. We saw the Bristol Falls. We got to see different things. Could we get out for the history of things? We could not because of COVID. Um, but we found a lot of snack shacks and his favorites were hot dogs with mustard and relish. We found creamy stands and when it was hard to find, he says, I don't see any creamies. It's time for a creamy. We're looking, we're looking. One of the other joys that I got to listen to was we would be in a town. We had no idea where we were, what road we were doing, where we were going. And he would say, are you lost? And it's like, well, the GPS would get us home. I said, I'm not quite sure where we are right this moment. He says, well, I, and I asked him, 
Are you lost? Well, I've been lost before, and this is what it looks like. <laughs> In June of 2020, he fell. It was the last of his walking. I lost my father on July 16th of 2020. I have not been able to bear myself to get into the car and travel all these places without my travel buddy. But I remember his voice saying, Crystal, get your mother out. Do these things with her. She refuses, but I'm vowed be determined to carry on our legacy because we've gone to the towns twice for each town did we get to experiment of knowing what the histories are no we did not do we remember every town we went to no but we've done an awful lot of roads and I did google lots of road names that are strange and unusual and got to see bear crossings, we got to see the falls, we've got to see most of the lakes. Little did we know there was a Lake Hortina down by Rutland. Very unusual. But a friend of mine, after my dad passing, made myself a memory bear. This is Morris the bear, and he travels with me everywhere. So this is my first meeting. And I decided I would make sure I got him his ball cap of Club 251. And he sits in the back seat. Sometimes he comes up in the front seat with a seat belt on. And we travel. Have I traveled a lot? No. But Morris, we will. Thank you so much, Crystal, for, for sharing that with us um, and letting us know about your, your time with your dad um, and how you're continuing that legacy as well. So thank you, Crystal. Any other members who wanted to share anything today about completing their quest? No? Great. Well, then now is the time for trivia which I am going to introduce another board member, uh, Hubie Norton, who puts together the trivia questions. Uh, and then after trivia is the raffle picking, and then we adjourn. So, uh, and thank you to Hubie for all the work that you do with this trivia too. I know it takes a good amount of time, so thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> I was thinking of an idea uh, for Steve, uh, and it's too bad that you can't record odors. And what, what brought to mind was, how many of you recall driving down Pine Street in Burlington past the maple plant and smelling that maple? Or being in Orwell when the wind was just right from that Ticonderoga <laughs> paper mill over there? <laughs> S similar to the smoldering wood chips at the Burlington McNeil plant. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe there's an opportunity for odor some way. But, but anyway, yeah, I have, I've, I've went around to a few tables. Uh, I have accepted a few bribes. So, uh, so anyway, let's get on with this. Uh, the first question, the Post Mills Airport is in what town? Thetford, correct, correct. Yay, yay, all right, all right. I you know, I thought that was kind of an easy one. That, by the way, uh, Post Mills, you know, that's also the home of the Vermontosaurus. That was, that was uh, mentioned to me just a bit ago. That, that's a, it's a wooden sculpture, 122 feet long, uh, and so on. But anyway, the Vermontosaurus. Uh, so you're in Vermont Route 102 in the county seat of Essex. What town are you in? Correct, Guild Hall, not Guild Hall. You know, that's, you got, you know, there's no D in Guild Hall. Traveling westerly from Danby on Vermont State Route 133 brings you into what town? Yeah, I, I, I had given one table a hint. You know, Paulette, unfortunately, has been, has some recent, uh, uh, been recently in the news for a couple of different things. But, but anyway, Paulette. 
Beat Your Falls. Uh, Steve was, he kind of, uh, kind of dodged around that a little bit. Uh, Beach of Falls is a census-designated town in, in, in t- place in what town? Canaan. Canaan. Uh, now, in, in, anyway, is doing this research, uh, I found out a census-designated place. It's something that uh, the Census Bureau does. It's, it's for statistical purposes. It's a certain place that's not incorporated. So like Beecher Falls, is, it's not incorporated. Uh, there are a lot of place names in Vermont that that we think they're villages, uh, and a village is an incorporated place, but it may not be a village. Okay, that Beecher Falls is a place that's a census-designated place. Uh, and, uh, and Beecher Falls, if you've not been there, is really, it's, it's quite interesting because you, you, you kind of come around the corner and there's this massive factory. And that was the home, the original home of Ethan Allen Furniture. Uh, and originally, you know, they employed over 600 people there. Uh, unfortunately, not, not as many. They still do employ some people there, but a lot of that manufacturing has gone out of state, some still in Orleans. Uh, what are the names of the two villages in the town of Bennington? Uh, this is, I learned about this. This is something new uh, to me. North Bennington is one. And Old Bennington. Yeah. So... There used to be a village of Bennington, uh, but that uh, became, uh, let's see, that, that was uh, disincorporated uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, now, Old Bennington had a population in 2020 of 156. And the Old, Billing, Old Bennington Cemetery, by the way, is uh, interesting in that uh, a lot of Revolutionary War soldiers are buried there, as well as our famous poet, Mr. Robert Frost who had an epitaph that says, well, close, I had a lover's quarrel with the world. Yeah. The hamlet, Steve kind of bounced around this a little bit too. Hamlet of Island Pond got its name of a nearby body of water. What town is it in? Brighton, yeah. Brighton is the town. And, and Island Pond, by the way, is another one of those census-designated places. It is not a village. Heading west over Roxbury Mountain. From Roxbury, you drop down into what Mad River Valley town? Warren. Yep. Warren. Yep. That used to be the used to be the spot where people would line up at the Warren store in order to get that Thursday delivery of Sip of Sunshine, that famous beer. That... In 1840, Daniel Webster made a Whig Party nominating speech to 15,000 people on the Kelly Stan Road in what town? Stratton. So that, this is a terrific ride through the Green Mountain National Forest, that Kelly Stand Road. It's closed in the wintertime, but boy, it, you know, pretty road. You're in the, you're in, I mean, you're in the woods, but it is, it's really, it's a, it's a National Forest Road, well-maintained and so on for forest purposes. Green River is a neighborhood in southern Vermont with a picturesque covered bridge and also the location of Fort Dummer. What town is this? Guilford, yep. Fort Dummer named for the Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, and Fort Dummer was initially established by the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1724, uh, and is considered the first permanent European settlement in what is now considered Vermont. There are two two two-lane covered bridges entirely in Vermont. One is at the Shelburne Museum, and the other is known as the Pulp Mill Bridge and goes between what two towns? And one, of them, one other was recently mentioned by Steve. Waybridge. Waybridge, yeah. Yeah. Monument Dairy Farms, best milk, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it, it uh, passes... Crosses over the Otter Creek, which, of course, is the longest river in Vermont. 
this, there has to be some horse people here, okay? So what was the name of Justin Morgan's horse? It rhymes with the name of Roy Rogers' horse, and the name is? Figure. See, there are some, I knew there were some. You see, that's why this is a, you know, you have to use the, the concentrated information. So go figure. Go figure. It was trigger. Go, go tr yeah, it was figure. The Gil, you are at the Gill Feather Turnip Festival, which is coming up, by the way. Uh, what town are you in? Wardsboro. Yeah. Extra credit if you know that the Gill Feather, Gil Feather Turnip uh, is a state vegetable. First grown in Woodsboro by a fellow by the name of Gillfeather, yeah. Twelve towns of Vermont to end with the suffix B-U-R-Y, like Middlebury. There are five of those towns that begin with S and end with B-U-R-Y. Name them. And I, I saw some folks said, well, I had four of them. What was the fifth one? Did, did anybody get all five? Good, good. Because one of the purposes here is to try to understand the, the degree of difficulty of these questions, you know. So do we need to make them a little more difficult or a little easier? <laughs> so the, the answers are St. Johnsbury, Salisbury, Shaftsbury, Shrewsbury, and Sudbury. Okay. So... So in, in, in looking and in doing this information, at it, it, any time, as, as I think many of you know and Steve knows, you, you do any history stuff, you know, you go down rabbit holes, okay? So I said, wait a minute, bury. What does bury mean? Well, it's an Anglo-Saxon from the word B-U-R-H, meaning a fort or fortified place. Uh, another common suff suffix is B-O-R-O, -O, like uh, Wardsboro, Starksboro, Brattleboro. Uh, and, and there's many more, of course. And that also comes from the Anglo-Saxon word B-U-R-H. And that also means a fort or fortified place. And to the best of my knowledge, none of those that ended B-U-R-Y or B-O-R-O -O ever had a fort or fortified place. <laughs> the Quinby. This is a little, maybe a little more obscure, but anyway, the Quimby County Lodge and Cottage is located on Forest Pond in what town? Averill is correct. Norton is close. Close, you get credit for being in the right county, okay? But Averill. Uh, and uh, Averill is one of those unincorporated towns in Vermont. Uh, you know, Averill, Ferdinand, Glastonbury, etc., And Lewis and Somerset are the others. Forest Pond, Averill, of course, is, is, I say better known if it's known for anything, is for Great Averill Lake and, and uh, Little, Averill, Little Averill Pond. Great Averill Pond and Little Averill Pond. Gilman is an unincorporated community and another one of those census-designated places in what town? Lunenburg. Got some Northeast Kingdom folks here? Lunenburg, correct. Yeah, it's being a pa great, pa there used to be a paper plant, great paper plant in Lunenburg. Another, another piece as a, uh, in, in doing some of this research, estimated population of Lunenburg in 2022 was 214. Or excuse me, Gilman. Gilman, that, that place is 214. Now, there's a story from World War II, uh, if some of you may recall, about there were, there were four chaplains on a troop ship going to Europe, and it was hit by a torpedo and was sinking. And these four chaplains... <laughs> gave their life vest to those other soldiers. And these chaplains went down with the ship. One of those chaplains was George Fox. And he was a he was a Methodist minister whose home church was in Gilman. 
uh, the legions, excuse me, <laughs> I'm a member of the legion, and this is why I'm a little bit. Uh, there are uh, uh, some uh, local American Legion clubs. They've gotten together, and they've purchased a church. They've rehabbed it, and they've made it a tribute to George Fox. And that is, that is open uh, at certain times of the year. So if you're in Gilman, uh, and anyway, uh, a piece of history that I was not aware of until I got into this. And excuse me. Town of Bristol, Vermont, was first named what? Pocock. Got to be a local, yeah. <laughs> they, they have a, every year they have a, they, I think they call it the Pocock Festival or whatever, every year. So, so anyway, uh, that name is uh, to honor a British admiral, Sir George Pocock, who di distinguished himself in naval battles in India and South America. The name was changed to Bristol by an act of the legislature in 1789. Of course, that was before, before Vermont was even a state. Largest town in Vermont in land area is Chittenden is correct. Now, this is interesting because one of the things in, in any, doing any history research is fact checking. Uh, Chittenden has 73, 73.8 square miles, that's according to Wikipedia. 74.2 square miles, according to the United States Census Bureau. Stowe is second at 72.76 square miles by Wikipedia, or 73.2 square miles, according to the townofstowe.org website. 72.57 square miles, according to the United States Census Bureau. 72.6 square miles, United States Census. So, any, depending, so when you're looking up information, you, you know, uh, you want to check your resources if it, if it is super important that you have it accurate. So anyway, I was, I was finally satisfied that Chittenden was indeed the largest town, even though Stowe on their website says that they are the largest town by land area state. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, and, and Stowe kind of, they, they kind of started out at six square miles like everybody else, but they kind of got a piece of sterling when that split up. So that made them bigger. Heading east out of Bennington on Vermont Route 9, the first town you come to is Woodford. You know, someone mentioned that they travel that road a lot and never knew what town that was that they were coming into. Interesting that Woodford was chattered 1753 by Benning Wentworth, the governor of New Hampshire, of Colony New Hampshire at the time. And Woodford and Stamford were chattered at the same time, March 6, 1753, making them tied for the second town chartered in the area to, that became the future state of Vermont after the first town that was chartered in Vermont, which was Benning. Yes, yeah, okay. <coughs> this is a little tricky one. 15 Vermont towns that border Canada, 14 of those towns not necessarily in order are North Troy, Albert, Norton, Franklin, Jay, Berkshire, Highgate, Richford, Troy, Canaan, Holland, Derby, Newport, Berkshire. What town is missing? No, not Aero. No. Swanton. Swanton. You gotta you gotta look at a map. Okay? Is that Swanton? There's a little piece of Swanton that hooks up around by Hog Island there that touches the Canadian border. That, uh, and last but not least, the hamlet of Goose Green is in what town? Hint, the movie Beetlejuice was filmed in this town, and of course there's now been a new release, of, or another release of Beetlejuice. So the town is Corinth. Yeah, that's kind of been in the news with the, with the movie. So the town is Corinth, and Goose Green was named... Uh, and, of course, this could be one of those urban myths, who knows, uh, for the color painted on the feet of geese as they were headed to market in Boston. So maybe that's a way that they could differentiate their geese from the next town over or whatever. But anyway, goose green because of geese feet. So let us know, you know, if it's, if it's too hard or it needs to be harder 
or whatever. How many, how many towns in Vermont, towns and city of Vermont now that are municipalities, there are 252 with the recent addition of the city of Essex Junction. So, and of course that does not count the Gores or the Grant. Thank you. Great. Thank you again, Hubie, for putting that together. I know it takes time and fact checking, fact checking, but um, this is our second year of doing it, I believe, and I think it's pretty popular amongst all the tables. Did any of the tables get it correctly right? All questions right? No. So <laughs> I think it's at a good level. <laughs> All right, the final part of our day um, is the raffle prizes. Um, so another board member, this is Shauna Trombley, she's going to help us with that. Um, sure, yeah, if you want to switch seats and do what I know, you may want to. Okay, and then I'll be sure, yeah, that sounds great. So this is prize package, oh, so I should say thank you first to all the local businesses um, that have donated to the raffle, as well as members. Dennis brings the Grafton cheese every year, so thank you to, for, for doing that. If you're present, please make sure you don't leave um, before you collect your raffle prize if you do win. Um, so with that, prize package number one is explore Southern Vermont with an overnight. Tom Martin. It's Tom Martin. Oh, Tom Martin's back there. Great. Thank you, Tom. Great. Thank you. So that was prize package number one. Prize package number two, outdoor recreation in Vermont. Just not gonna leave it. Uh, Elise, how do you say your last name? <laughs> yes, exactly, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, Elise. <laughs> okay, prize package number three, ski and stay at J Peak. Mel Michael? Oh, all right. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> hey. Prize package number four. Museum hopping and drinks. Let's see. Uh, Beth Howard. And she might also be online. I should say the um, folks who are live streaming also could participate in this. So. I th believe she's online. It's on, it's up there. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you, Beth. Okay, prize package number five, Vermont goodies. Trying not to look. <laughs> oh, Drew Nelson. <laughs> we know Drew, former board member of the 251 Club. Prize package number six, more Vermont goodies. I'm oh, sorry, I can't see. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see, Charles Horvath, and he might also be online. I think he is, so congratulations to Charles. Prize package number seven, a day in Shelburne. There we go. There we go. Deanna Briggs. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> okay, so for these next two, we have two more prize packages, and you do have to be present to win. So um, if the person is not in the room, we will draw again then. So this is prize package number eight, Vermont Country Store Gift Basket and Grafton Cheese. Let's see. Uh, Sally Reynolds. All right, great. Congratulations, Sally. And then for the last one, uh, breakfast cheese and maple syrup. Okay. Oops, do I have two? Uh, Richard Tracy. Wait, right there. Great. Congratulations. Well, great. Thank you again to all the businesses, and thank you to all of you for buying raffle tickets too. As I said, this is our only fundraising event of the year, so we very much support your, uh, appreciate your support.
And so with that, we are at the end of the annual meeting. Thank you again to Steve for being our guest speaker and to all the board members for helping out and for all of you for being here and being such great members of the 251 Club. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.